Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Fundamentalists Podcast. We apologize once again for our haphazard uploading schedule, but to make it up to you, we are presenting you today with a jam-packed episode. Instead of just being me, Elliot Morgan, alongside Dr. Peter Rollins, we have a very special guest by the name of, please put your hands together, Jay Baker. It's nice how you guys treat your guests. That's really lovely. We're not used to having guests. No. We're friends. Our fr yeah, well, that's true. Well, listen, so this is what we're going to be talking about in this particular episode, folks. First of all, if you would like to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash the fundamentalists. We're going to be uploading all sorts of fun stuff in the near future. This is the year of the fundamentalists. But in order to dive into this particular episode, we should prime everybody on who exactly our guest is so that you don't feel lost in the wind or uh, adrift at sea and you instead have some sort of connection, whether it be emotional or memorial with Mr. Jay Baker. I've been so, in a coma for the past five years. Exactly. Yeah. Jay, <laughs> explain to our listeners who who you who you who am I? Um, well, I mean, the obvious one is my parents. Everybody wants to talk about that, so we'll just get out of that way. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. Jim, what? What the hell? <laughs> yeah, I know it's a big deal. Huge uh, televangelist in the '80s had a scandal. Blah blah blah. There was just a movie about my mom, Eyes of Tammy Faye. Um, I've also been doing a, running a community for called Revolution Gathering for 23 years now. Wow! Uh, I've written three books. Uh, I've had a doc, Sundance documentary okay. about my life. Um, dance documentary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A dance documentary as well. That's harder to find. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm just I speak, I work, I think. And I live. And Is it in that order? Yeah. Good. That's yeah. a good way. That's a good way to do it. <laughs> um... Well, this is, we're so not used to, first of all, also, for those of you who have been waiting for us patiently to upload an episode, Pete, how are you doing? I'm this doing is, good. Yes, yeah, this is yeah. the first podcast of the new year. Yeah, is it? My goodness, we're well, that we behind. Were... Yeah, 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 that's not good. Yeah, I'm doing good. We just went for cigars, but I'm feeling a wee bit green. I kind of, we yeah. went round. I like, you know, it makes me look cool with a big cigar. And then halfway through, you just suddenly start to feel that sickness yeah. come on but i think it's passing you wow. know, the, the sickness i'm yeah. impressed that you, you you're muscling through it yeah yeah of course i'm the i'm a professional yeah well this is a, such a topsy-turvy episode because if for our visual uh uh audience members who are can see the video at youtube.com slash la morgan i'm on i'm in the ames chair the Eames chair right now i don't know how you yeah. say it you went like you went straight like I. It was like like Daddy started to cut the the turkey. It was like it's yep. my my turn for the Eames chair. Beelined like, it. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> I'm feeling a bit Thank funny you. about it. Uh, it's my yeah. show now, folks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Jay, you you mentioned in passing very quickly, which, by the way, I think you should write the Netflix uh, summary for The Eyes of Tammy Faye because I was at, I love how you were like a scandal, blah blah blah, and then uh, <laughs> it just kept it moving. But I I watched it recently. I watched oh, you the did. film. Okay, I had a great time. Okay. Um, there's a few things I absolutely want to ask you about. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I will make it really clear that I did talk to the actors, but I did not have any input on the film. Nor okay. Did I make anything from the film? Okay. Well, that changes today. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to be starting a petition. But so, in general, what were your thoughts on it? And then I'm going to narrow it down to one specific question. I like I... how Pete touches the microphone as though I've never held a microphone before. <laughs> yeah. Touches this wire because sometimes goes. Oh, I got a big clicky. Okay, he doesn't like, want you to feel alone. <laughs> no, he's really controlling. Um, he's gonna put a blanket over you in a second. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, <laughs> because he. So, what was the question? Uh, general thoughts on the film. What was your? What was it like to to see a film based on uh, your parents and their legacy and their history and uh, its present day? You're watching it. It's got Hollywood stars in it. It's got my favorite Spider-Man in it, uh, Andrew Garfield. What was that like? Well, it was interesting because I first flew out. They flew me out to L.A., and me and Pete actually saw it together at uh, at Fox Studios or whatever they're called now, mm -hmm. Searchlight Studios. Or sure. But um, we saw it there, and it was pretty emotional, I'd say. Like, yeah. I was really emotional about it, but it was a few months until out. I knew that there was a few things that weren't done, like, linear, you know, mm -hmm. in the film. Um, Jessica, who I talked to a lot, kind of prepared me for that. Um, you know, I mean, I was really emotional at the end. It was a really huge thing. Um, and then a few months later, I flew out to New York for the premiere and saw it with an audience. And that was a little tougher. I ended up leaving a little bit early because there's a few moments that, like, if you if it, if you didn't live it, it was, yeah, it's, it's kind of a silly, funny, some funny parts. But it had, like, one part where my dad's doing an interview on 2020, and it was, like, literally 
probably the darkest moment in my family's life. When oh, wow. I, yeah, my parents are doing this interview, and I remember sitting on the other side of all the lights and stuff and just kind of like, what's going on? Our life's falling apart, you know? And some people snickered because my dad had a Freudian slip during that, you know? And um, What was the Freudian slip? They were like, are you gay or something like that? Or like, And he's like, yes. I mean, no. I mean, yeah, yeah you know? And so everybody kind of laughed. And, and um, uh, I was with... Uh, the girl I was seeing at the time, you know, was like, do you want to go? And I was like, yeah, let's go. And we went outside and then we yeah. went over to the, to the after party and then, yeah, breathed, relaxed. And, you know, it was weird, though, because I was like, people were talking about my parents right next to me again at the after party and I had to go over and be like, hey, those are my parents and you can ask me questions, but I'm sitting here just trying yeah. to watch what you're saying, you know. And Did I talked to questions? the director and people like that. No, they didn't ask questions. They yeah. were like afraid because <laughs> they were like, oh, you're not supposed to confront people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Trigger warning. That's what they say. <laughs> This one, I remember the uh, story of the, the trans uh, guy who you said, you look like my oh, mom. Yeah, that was, yeah it was a trans guy. It was a, um, a drag queen. You know, I go, oh, you look like my mom. Like, yeah, I got the wig from her, honey, because they didn't realize who I was. Yeah. And then I said something like, oh, my mom had same dress, and he said something really snotty to me as well. Dress, thought I was taking the piss, you know? Yeah. And so one of the drag queens I walked up to in the theater, and I was like, hey, you know, my mom is Tammy Faye. So when I was saying, oh, my God, you know, and then other time I was in the bathroom and then the drag queen comes into the bathroom and I'm like, hey, you know, when I mentioned your dress and you're kind of snotty outside, I'm like, my mom is Tammy Faye. You, I was complimenting mm -hmm. you. Oh, my God, I had no idea. You know, it's like. Well, that's the happy ending. Yeah, though. it was a happy, you know, I try to be a peacemaker, you know. Um, and, you know, I'm sure people, they're probably used to getting a hard time anyway. Yeah, all the time, I'm sure. Um Man, so that's wild. Okay, now that's, can I ask you my very specific question? Sure. All right, you don't have to answer this. I'm going to okay. cut it out. But there's a scene that I definitely thought about you during. About, oh, was it when I was, oh, during the yeah. love scene? Yes. So for context, there's a scene where an unborn Jay is. In my mother's stomach. In your mother's stomach and then. Womb. Womb, as they say in the science class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, if you want to get technical, and then uh, he, and then she, she, she straddles, she straddles, and and and, go, and and what? How was that for you, Jay? That was extremely <laughs> uncomfortable. And the time, it would have had me born in 1980 had that happened. Okay. I was born in 1975. Okay. So it didn't happen. Gotcha, gotcha. I was way. wondering. That's all and, I wanted to know. Um, and as funny thing is, is my girlfriend at the time. When I was talking to Jessica, a producer came over and was like, yeah, we were just really trying to just, we just all about celebrating her life. And if you knew my, my ex girl, my ex, she's pretty frank with people. She's like, oh really? Like celebrating Tammy Faye by having her pregnant, straddling a man, having a water break on his dick. And I was like, yeah. you know, so I was pretty proud of her for that. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was nice. It was nice Saying the thought. Yeah, Saying she said what thought. she felt. But um, yeah, so my mom did have a romantic type of affair with that man. Okay. But it was in 1980, and I, and I, I was born five years earlier. So. Yeah, it's like they take all the facts of and what really happened and just mix it all up. Yeah, I mean, like, they have my dad in prison, in the wrong prison, after he got out of prison. You know what I mean? So some of the time... Yeah, you know, I, I kind of was like, I didn't... I, I was hoping... Um, the prison thing sort of happens in the movie, like, blink Like that, minute. like, they don't really explain Yeah, Pete, anything. did you... Were we talking about that? Oh yeah, no, just that. Yeah, that 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 was completely one moment yeah. in the night. Yeah, they didn't really expand on it. Yeah, I didn't know if you. I was trying to. Yeah, no, I saw you. I was just agreeing with you, and I noticed you were trying to bring me back into the conversation. I, just forgot, I didn't know what to <laughs> say. Like, no, what what was interesting, <laughs> but about the film that I thought was hilarious and very not hilarious yes. was <laughs> the the, bir the birth of Jay was the moment where everything turned dark because everything was going swimmingly and then it was like the birth of Jay and that very moment, the whole thing went dark. It's like, that was interesting. They chose that. Yeah, the, the climactic uh, everything, the sky is falling moment yeah. is right with you as a baby. And changed time. all the timings of reality just to make sure make that sure. your birth was yeah. kind of like, yeah. Uh, uh, I am the Antichrist. I was hoping that was going to be the most factually accurate part. Yeah. Of the, yeah. <laughs> the Everybody like, was. No, and that like, part they nailed. And, and when he's, you know, when he's like the guy He's playing my dad. He's like, get that kid out of here. You know, like he's like, take the kid away, yeah. take the baby away. You yeah, know, get like, out of here, Jay. <laughs> I'm like, come on. <laughs> oh, so. beautiful. Okay, well, um, now that it's gone and it's over and it's done, did it? Does it feel like a blink of an eye when you look back at it? Or are you like, yeah, it was kind of a blink of an eye. I mean, I remember I was in Belfast at Spark, one, one of Pete's events, when I first talked to Jessica Chastain and Andrew Garfield, and that was really surreal, yeah. you know? But then it just kind of happened fast. So it was, yeah, it was, it went, went, 
went pretty fast, you know, and it was mm-hmm. like, you know, and of course you had all the Hollywood, like all the, like the, their, their press guys that work there where they hire and they're like, oh, Jay, this is going to be huge for you. This is going to be big for you. You know, and it was all bullshit, you know, so. Yes. Um, <laughs> bottom feeding, uh, blood sucking, um. Uh, Hollywood entities, yes. But I was really happy because I had some friends who were upset that I went because they thought, well, you're you're giving your okay for the film because you went to the premiere. And I'm like, well, you can say what you want to say and guess what I do. But I honestly, like, I went to the film because it was a celebration of my mother. Yeah. Not because it was perfect and not to be like, this movie has got Jay Baker's approval. I was like, no, you know, it's like I got to go to New York and be with people in Hollywood and talk to actors and actually tell the director, like, you could have done this better. I, when I met the screenwriter, I was like, man, you, I really wish you could have called me because you would have had a much better movie. Yeah. You know? And so I was able to, like, speak truth to some of these folks. And so for me, it's like I just got to be me and I oh, think yeah. my mom would have been proud of that and it was also really cool was one of the moments when I came out of the theater and I was just kind of having a hard time my sister's song which is at the end of the movie my mm-hmm. sister recorded a song for the movie like started playing and that was really really meant a lot to me and I think that the moment when I was with Pete at the film and the movie ends and my sister's song came on it was like literally my life flashing before my eyes yeah you know like every like wow. like me and my sister like we're we survived this like so wild. Yeah. It's so, beyond comprehension. Yeah. Like, even just in the movie where you're getting stuff left out and mixed together, it's like seeing it was just like... And they actually had an actor who played me, but he got cut out. Oh, really? Yeah, but I met him. He's a really nice guy. So. Oh, that's a bummer. Well, he ruined everything, so... Yeah. <laughs> it's from the moment he was born, according to the movie. He's uh, a hit man. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> you, got to, uh, you got to engage uh, this weird chapter of your life. Now you're engaging a different part of your life, and I think this will be where we get to incorporate Peter more... Uh, We'd love to have you in on the conversation. Yeah, you know, I'm actually really enjoying just... Are you just watching it? Yeah, you're just watching the master at work? Yeah. yeah. The master class? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so you're in psychoanalysis right now. Yes, and... Let's turn it back around. Uh-huh. Uh, callback, if you will. Yes. Is I am in psychoanalysis because I've been talking to Pete about getting into it for years. Um, but when I realized this movie was coming in, I was like, this is the time to go. So I started going as soon as I heard that they were going to start making this movie. It's like, I need to confront some of this stuff. Nice. What a great connection between our two topics for this podcast. Boom. If I'd have known that, I would have said it like I knew, but I did it. So uh, yeah. what can you do? Um, so you're, you're doing psychoanalysis like uh, proper, like the psychoanalysis, the the stereotypical like what you imagine this how we're sitting here like. how me and you are sitting here is i don't lay down okay how we're sitting here is pretty much how it happens yeah you do know you, i don't do it three times a week because i can't afford it no one can so i do it once a week and with the hopes that eventually i can do it twice a week and sometimes last week i did do it twice a week twice yes. so sometimes i do and um yeah i, I nice. believe it's Traditional psychoanalysis, but we'll let Pete yeah. The- <laughs> yeah. Pete's like, I- I- I'll take, I'll take it. Yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. No, it is. It's probably psychotherapeutic psychoanalysis because yeah, pr- the true psychoanalysis is that three, four times a week and no communication. So it is, but it is psychoanalysis and the psychoanalysis, but psychotherapeutic. So your analyst does also talk a lot more, yeah. a bit more. But yeah, but it's it's proper psychotherapeutic psychoanalysis and you've done lots of other types of therapies and with some of which have been helpful and useful but this one's kind of taken you to a, a different place yeah definitely this is definitely taking me to a different place i mean i've done dialectic behavioral therapy i've done the one where you do the rapid eye movement one emt mm-hmm. i don't even can't even remember what it's called which was heavy it was super heavy type of therapy um i've been in therapy most of my life um but what i've realized with psychoanalysis is that it starts to take away all your coping mechanisms, mm-hmm. but not just your bad ones. Mm-hmm. Like it started like the DBT stuff that I learned, like sit through it, it's just a thought, it's gonna pass by, radical acceptance. Like it even starts taking those away because you really are confronting your traumas, mm-hmm. like face first, and then finding out how those traumas are connected to other things, finding out that things that you thought were just life or coping mechanisms, like the things that I thought were coping mechanisms, aren't even that yeah i mean they were but i have a lot more that i didn't even realize i had so it's like it, it, it's crazy how it undoes the work of therapy because i would almost say like therapy and seeing a psych uh, seeking a counselor or a therapist is great but it's kind of a band-aid mm-hmm. and this is kind of with the idea that you know we're going to get to a place where you don't have to do this anymore yeah very deep 
uh, sounds very difficult. Um, what can you name a coping mechanism that you thought was a coping mechanism? It turned out it was not a coping mechanism that you decided. Well, no, that was. I can tell you something I was, didn't think yes. was a coping mechanism, but came. Well, I mean, dating. Oh, night. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. always needing, like mm -hmm. a partner in my life mm -hmm. was a, was a big one. Um, I thought mine was like shopping all the time, you know, and it was really obvious. Like, oh, I buy it. I collect stuff, so I've stopped collecting stuff. You know, and I stopped that a little while ago. That's when I'm I'm throwing things out. And I'm like, oh, I've got this thing nailed. And mm -hmm. he's like, oh, well, you know, you're trying to fill that. And it's weird because it's like it's not your, you know, he's Freudian, but he's not like you're trying to fill that mother figure. He's like you're trying to fill the father figure with the women in your life, you know, and having these relationships. So, you know, you need to be aware of that. And, and you're repeating some of these same things that you've repeated in relationships with your parents, now with your, your partners. And I no. went through a really bad breakup um, right after the film. And after the premiere of the film, and um, that just really brought up everything of that, yeah. that I was dealing with. Oh, so, great timing! Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was it was rough. Yeah. Um, any thoughts on that, Pete? Um, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Still just feeling sick from the cigar, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just gonna throw up uh, <laughs> from the off the side of the uh, sofa here. <laughs> All right. Well. One thing about the movie that I forgot to say was you couldn't ask for a better person to play Jerry Falwell than Vincent D'Onofrio. So I was so excited that King was a Kingpin. Yeah, Kingpin. Yeah, it was yeah. playing. You know, we had Spider Man as my dad. Kingpin as Jerry Falwell. Oh yeah, yeah. I thought that was That's pretty great. pretty amazing. Doesn't get much cooler. And than that. Jessica Chastain, I would have not guessed at all would play my mom because she's tall and she's lanky yeah. and she's you know skinny and and just different. You know, but I think she did a great job and. Um, she did a wonderful job. Yeah, yeah. I, love I it. thought she did a great job. I, I thought it was, it was. I really think. I think my mother would have enjoyed it. My mother might have not enjoyed that moment where they, the, you know, that you were talking about because I think she would be offended that she was like pregnant with me at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, would be like That's the biggest fair. thing of like that didn't happen. You know, because she's very defensive of her baby cubs. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think it was a great celebration, and and it gives you a chance to talk about it. You know, you get to talk yeah. about this stuff and deal with it. Speaking of um, now, going back to the psychoanalysis, of when you when you say like you stopped uh, collecting stuff or you you've minimized it, yeah. Do, do you like this better? Like, do you like this version of yourself, or yes. do you miss? Yeah, okay. You don't I've, miss collecting stuff. You don't have the urge. No, like I like no, and I see stuff online. I go like, oh, I can't believe they just made that. You know, because they're always making something that was like back in your as my childhood memory oh, yeah. sparks. You know, I'm like, oh, they remade that. You know. And what I do is I just look at it and I go, that's awesome. And then just don't get it. You know what I mean? I just yeah. appreciate it and just go, oh, that's really cool that they did that. You know, and, and I feel better. I feel better having less crap around the house. I mean, I have two kids. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old. So, I mean, I've got toys all over my house anyway. Um, but, yeah, no. Yeah. I, and I'm starting to, like, see things change slowly. But then there's times where I feel like the gears are moving and changing in my head. And nice. I'm, like, in this kind of lost place. Um, in between sessions, and I went back to the analyst, and I was like, is this normal? You know, like, I feel like I'm going crazy. And he's like, no, this is part of the process is, you know, things are moving around because you're getting in touch with it because you're getting dreams interpreted. You're getting, yeah. you know, finding out about your unconscious, you know. You're finding these coping mechanisms, and, and you just start to kind of change things. And I think even Pete, you, you've probably seen a little bit of a difference since yeah. I've started going, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, like, when I went through this breakup, like, it was really hit me heavy. For like three months, I was like, uh. And then I woke up one day and I was just like, and I, and I was working through this and other stuff in my, my analyst because, you know, I'll be like, my girlfriend, he's like, all right, let's go back to your dad in 1982. You know, you're like, no, I want to talk. He's like, we are talking about it, you know, that kind of thing. But it was like, I woke up one day and was like, oh, I mourned it. Mm -hmm. I can move on now. Nice. And it was really strange. I mean, I don't think that happens for everybody, but it was a type of thing of that where I feel that being psychoanalyst, being in an analysis, really is working well for me and i really wish everybody could go and i really wish insurance covered it and, and yeah. you know i just got new insurance finally got insurance for like last week and of course it no, doesn't, it doesn't cover it so i don't have any America. insurance covers it yeah it reminds me of um what you're talking about reminds me of the old adage that uh nothing can be united that is not first separated so you're basically having to separate and dissolve all this stuff and then break everything down so that you can actually start piecing it together in a nice new way yeah, and you know, it, it is. It's like it is kind of like this, like new life in a way. You know, it's kind of resetting things. And, and I look at like the cost even for myself is like, 
you know, like someone would look at like college or something like that. I'm like, yeah. this is going to make me a better dad, a better communicator, a better writer, mm -hmm. a better friend, you know? So like, this is More an investment human. in my future. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. Any thoughts on that, Pete? Yeah. Just that, you know, for you, I think, you know, you notice in psychoanalysis how you're replaying in the present so much of the past. That's the interesting thing. So even whenever you were collecting things, um, a lot of them were like toys, like these things which were actually connected to, again, child, a certain period in your past. So what you were thinking about in the present uh, was, was a re living of something that was past. So if we don't know our history, we're condemned to repeat it. So it's interesting as you know, you saw this movie of your life and you're making all of these connections with growing up the way you did and then how that connects with your relationships in the present. That, that realization is kind of like just uh, freed you to a certain extent. Yeah. And I think one of the things that what it did was is the collecting, this is really strange, is that it had, all my toys were in my room when I was a kid and I played in my room and I was kind of a, a loner kid. And... I ever the big traumas that we're dealing with. One of the big traumas is this: me standing in front of my parents' door as a kid when I was little at night, and wanting to go in and not going in. And it was almost as though that collecting kept my mind downstairs. Mm -hmm. You know, it kept my mind away from confronting. You know, and now it's like, now what do we confront? What's behind that door? Mm -hmm. So it's it's really been interesting. Yeah. It's 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 really beautiful and amazing and and I've been listening to like some of Freud's lectures and things like that and I've been really like blown away by seeing that and also my my analyst is Hegelian so that's been really cool because mm -hmm. he you know embraces the dialectic and contradiction yep. and, and and all that so it's been just you know I really believe in the guys because he, he's always like what do you think of me how do you feel about this you know I'm like I believe in your work you know I believe what you do the analyst asked that yeah interesting. That's what I said. Interesting. Let's interesting. Tell me more about that. Uh, interesting. Um, that's our time for today. Uh, uh, how'd you guys meet, Pete? How'd you meet Jay? Oh, yeah. So when I first moved to New York, uh, or just outside New York, I had a, we had a mutual friend, someone who'd read some of my books, and he reached out to me and said, oh, you know, you, you should come down to Brooklyn. He was very close friends with Jay, worked with Jay. And I went into this little place called Pete's Candy Store, and in the back... There was this little room and Jay was speaking and I was very impressed because it was very messy and funny and very kind of like, you know, like uh, disorganized, but in a really like, like comedic way. Like I was watching this kind of comedian and I was like, this is a great kind of, uh, you know, shtick that this guy's got. It's very yeah. good, you know. And then I realized that's just him. You know, he's this guy. <laughs> he <laughs> sits down. Just a genius. Just a genius. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was funny because you just, um, I'd been lent this house because I, I, came to America, someone was uh, being my patron and lent me this beautiful house for three years. Uh, I went from a squat in Belfast, basically, to this house. And we met just as you, it was shortly after your, your mom had passed and you were in a relationship and that relationship had just split. And all of this stuff was coming up for Jay. Relationship, again. Yeah, because yeah, that, that was the thing, that relationship almost protected you from mourning my mother, your and mother. My, and my first marriage, because my mother... My mother died, and then a week later, I found out my wife was having an affair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so wow. Went, went, yeah, went into this relationship, and that, like, what people do sometimes is um, if something terrible happens, there's a, what they call a fetish object, but it might be as long as they've got the dog, the dog kind of, it's when the dog dies that they mourn the relationship ending, or someone loses their child and they keep the room exactly as it was, but when they finally take the room apart, that's when the morning happens. So the morning is held off. Some object is able to kind of like, because because there's just so much suffering. So for Jay, I think this this girl he was going out with held back a lot of that morning for the first divorce yeah. and for the uh, and for your mother's death. Yeah. So whenever this was happening, I just basically we just met, we got on well, and I said to him, "Listen, I've been lent this really nice house, um, and it's got like spare room, and you know, if you want to get out of New York and, and just." be at my place for, for a week or two, you know, you're welcome. And uh, I think that was just the, at the right moment, you were wanting to get out of Brooklyn for a bit. So you came down to the house and uh, kind of spent some time there. And Yeah, and I mean, I've never told you this before, but there was actually no girl that broke up with me. It was just the house was really nice. I get it. 
<laughs> you know, yeah, you know, I just was like, oh, oh. I was going to say it's yeah. like the, the uh, past repeating over and over again. I'm like, well, you, I see where you're sleeping at Pete's place again right here. So it, uh, I did have quite a few people who would kind of like, because you were just coming down for a few days and suddenly it became the summer residence. Yeah, you were the, summer residence. He would come up at the weekend with all of his clothes to wash and all of this. I would literally get on the train. Like, I would get on the, 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 the L train to go to his house with literally a giant, like, army-sized pack of laundry. Mm -hmm. But then you don't just get on that train. Then you go to Grand Central Station and get on the real train and then take that train to Connecticut. And so I'm just there with my thing looking like I've come out from, you know, the military, some secret yeah. ops, and then go and like wash my clothes. Like and... you're a boy running away in the 19, early 1900s. <laughs> yes. Right there, Where's it going? On a stick, <laughs> a little knapsack. It was pretty fantastic. It was a good time. I mean, Pete was depressed. I was depressed. But, uh, you know... Now every, all that's changed. Good old days. Now, yeah, now we're <laughs> extremely very too happy people. Yes, all the time. Uh, do you feel, uh, Jay and, and Pete, let me know if you have any thoughts on this. Do you feel like your psychoanalysis is going to come to an end, that you're one day going to wake up and go, ha ha, solved all that? I mean, life is obviously going obviously to create more problems. But I do, I do. I really believe. Nice. I think... I'm a true believer. I think like in a year, year and a half, I think I'll be able to walk out of there. I mean, as well as I feel now, I know something better is coming. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there, but I know there's also something darker coming because I know there's some dark stuff that we've got to deal with and some stuff that with my dad that I have to deal with and confront that's going to be really, really difficult. So, Do you want me to do it for you? Yes. Okay. You let I'll me know. hire you as an actor. Hi, sir. You don't know me. <laughs> I was on YouTube for a well, little bit. Well, he hasn't bit. seen me in a long time, so he could just be like, Dad! <laughs> yeah, I could do it. I think we could pass. I could pass for you. Uh, I'll just put some fake tattoos on. Pete, what were you going to say? Oh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, yeah, one of the things in analysis is that people go sometimes because they're because of a fixation, because their desire is stopped. It's stopped up on something or someone, and it doesn't move. And so analysis doesn't kind of make you feel happier or better with your life or anything like that. Sometimes it, it cultivates a conversation with your unconscious, but... One of the things that happens is the fixation gradually goes. It's almost like time stops sometimes. Sometimes in a relationship with a family or a partner, literally time stops. You know, time's a great healer, except whenever there's a fixation. And then the fixation means that somehow time doesn't heal. You just can't get beyond it, can't get beyond it, can't get beyond it. And gradually doing psychoanalysis without even noticing the fixation often begins to weaken and time enters back in and you can start to move forward. And so this is, you know, can be called the, um, I suppose the, the, the chain of signifiers that your, your desire starts to move again. And so I think that's something that's happening is that, you know, there's certain fixations that have happened that you couldn't get beyond. But as you start to unpick those, um, you know, life opens up a little bit more. I don't know about all that. <laughs> no, that was very nice. Um, well, what's next for you, Jay? What are you working on right now? Are you uh, still, is it primarily personal um, psychoanalysis and figuring stuff out, or are you experiencing a new rebirth of creative <laughs> potential? Um, you know, yeah, I'm reading, um, uh, I'm reading some stuff on Hegel right now and trying to study Hegel. I have a 10-year plan. To wow. Study Hegel. Um, oh, to study Hegel. Okay. I think yeah. just in general. No, 10 year plan to, 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 to study Hegel and try to figure him out. And I'm, I'm liking some of the layers that are, that are, they're coming loose. And I, I've, I've put that into my, my, you know, I, I, revolution used to be called a church and, and, and now I, you know, call it a gathering because I just feel like that word holds too much baggage with it. Um, but I'm able to take some of that in there, some, you know, philosophy that I've learned from from Pete and and some Tillich and and mm -hmm. uh, Dr. King and, and different things like that and kind of work, put 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 some of the stuff into my work and even I, I I'm very transparent in my work so I'm able to even take what I'm learning through analysis into that so I continue to work I continue to do this like weekly talk mm -hmm. for revolution um, I'm working on a project that I can't re we can't really talk about can we? Little, I, think, right? I can just say I'm working on a project about my the mother. The new Lord of the Rings. Yeah. We yeah, know. All right, yeah. <laughs> I'm the Hobbit. <laughs> yeah, it's <yeah, we> <laughs> the Hobbit. And, and, uh, yes, I've heard about that. That's very exciting. What about Hegel? Did you, it makes you go, oh, cool. 
he just seems to understand. Well, I mean, uh, Todd McGowan really switched on the light for me in his book. What's the book called? Uh, the, the Emancipation After Hegel. That's right. Or, yeah. And I and so I met him in Belfast uh, when I was there for Wake, and I got the book. Didn't think I would be that interested in it, but his Hegel had very interesting concepts about Christianity. And the, on, on Christ and, the, and lo, the whole love ideal of Christianity, and that really drew me in. And the co- ideas of contradiction mm-hmm, mm-hmm, being mm-hmm. something that can be higher than truth really drew me in because I'd been going through this dialectic behavioral therapy stuff. So, yeah, that really, like, just... Cool. Hegel seems to get, to get it. Um, and now it's like I kind of hold Hegel in a special place, but it's, what's really funny is, is that, I'm you know, I, I've never gone to school for philosophy, and so it's interesting to uh, see how many people are like he's so untouchable, or you can't understand Hegel. And I'm sure there is, a, and I understand why because there's a lot of stuff that just makes my brain hurt. Mm-hmm. But there's also some really powerful, simple truths I think that we could just awaken to right away. And so I think that's what draws me into Hegel, nice. and I try to put, put take that with me into my own work and and make it more. Uh, approachable. Are you reading Hegel, Hegel, or are you reading people talking about Hegel? I'm reading people talking about nice. Hegel. I'm, I, I I've listened to Hegel uh, on, 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 on book on tape, and I was like, okay, I'm going to wait a little bit while before I dive into that. Okay, it's so, enough of that. Yeah. But I, I went, you know, I went to Pete and said, I want to start studying Hegel. And Pete was like, this is the book. And Pete actually got it for me, bought it, sent it to me. And I've been reading that. This like nice. a giant book that's commentary and a book this big is yeah. like this big. And, um, yeah, just started studying, and you know, I mean, that's how I got introduced to Tillich by Pete, you know, and got really deep into Tillich and have everything Tillich's ever written. And so, you know, I really jump into to people when they spark something that seems, uh, God, uh, sparks something, mm-hmm. that, you yeah, know, like just just like like life, go deeper and deeper, a deeper, and deeper meaning web. of life. Yeah, um, yeah, we yeah, have one of the things on that. Is which I think you're doing at the moment very well. Is you're using this work to try to help people argue well, yes. and uh, so do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because that's, yeah. that's interesting work you're doing, where especially in the current kind of climate where uh, conflict is difficult and uh, where we haven't even rubbed like, shoulders with each other because of COVID for so long, and we don't really we're not very good at relating to each other we're fine and so i think a lot of your work has been about how to and especially with your past as well kind of um you've seen the divisions of religion you've experienced those divisions in your life and uh, so do you think that's that's a new chapter in your work i that, do yeah that's that's good insight because it's like my parents were so scapegoated um when i was in the 80s you know it was just like they were almost scapegoated on the behalf of every other televangelist that no one liked, that they, everybody just put their anger and hate towards them. But it was also, uh, you know, they were equal opportunists, defendists, so they defend, they offended the, 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 the left Christians and the right Christians, and everybody just kind of turned on them, you know, but they were kind of scapegoats. And I still to this point where I still have to live with that pain. People are like, oh, what's wrong with cancel culture? I'm like, I'm 45 years, 46 years old, and I, you know, still have the fall. My parents' mistakes are still, like, printed right before everything I've ever do. So it's, it's, yeah. uh, so for me, I started to notice that people are just completely just destroying each other. And rather than having, you know, any type of conversations or any type of conflict, they just would go straight to war. Mm-hmm. And so what I've kind of put, tried to put into my work is, and this has kind of almost come a tagline for, for what we're doing right now is kind of arguing well. Mm-hmm. And so everybody talks about diversity, but usually what they mean by diversity is like skin tone or sexuality or things like that. But what I've tried to do in my community is get diversity of thought in in the community. So we have people who are conservatives, people who voted for Trump, such and such. We have liberals who, uh, you know, toe the line and, and we have woke folks. And we have these folks who are able to get online, listen to my talks, and have discussions in the comments, and then push back on me at the end if they want, or agree, whatever, you know, but usually it's a little pushback. But what I've we've been trying to do is teach everybody how to really argue well, and by using like a lot of Paul's work, right now I'm going through the book of Galatians, 
um, which is my favorite book. And it, it, it's Paul's dealing with a conflict of these two different communities trying to come together, like one that's been staunch in Judaism their whole life and wants to keep all that into Christianity. Another part that's just like people who were Gentiles and never had any Christianity and were actually a warrior culture. And he's trying to get this group, these groups to not scapegoat each other and have hard conversations by actually writing a letter that's a very hard conversation to have with people. And so I've seen people change. I've seen people in the community, like really like progressive folks and woke folks coming like, you know, I don't believe in cancel culture anymore, you know, because I believe we've got to have harder conversations. We've got to have tough conversations and that no mistake should be the end, you know? So also grace is a big thing for me is how do we show grace to people? And grace doesn't necessarily mean like, you're just giving it and no consequences. I mean, life has consequences, but grace is saying you're accepted even when you're in the consequences, even when you have made the mistake, you are accepted. So doing that and then teaching people how to argue well without throwing each other under the bus. Because what I started to notice, like in the early, you know, in the 80s and 90s, it was a lot of the uh, evangelical Christians telling like the parents to kick their gay kids out. And then we got here and all of a sudden I noticed it was a lot of folks saying, you know, a lot of progressive Christians saying, well, if your parents voted for Trump, you know, kick you have to stop talking to him and kick him out. Yeah. And so it's the same thing. They just trade one legalism for another legalism. And so I was like, we've got to stop this. And with social media, it's so easy to just tear each other apart. I was like, this is really awful. Yeah, and then in social media, you're, it only adds distance to the other. Uh, so it creates a, you don't, you don't even, like you're saying, Pete, rub shoulders with people. You don't have the same sort of like physical presence to be able to take in somebody's. Plus, you figure what it's like over... 90% of communication is non-verbal. And so when we're doing all of our communication over like tweets and Facebook posts, like you're not getting, the, you're not getting the, you're only getting a fraction of what's really going on with the other person. My problem with arguing um, productively is that I'm right all the time and it's yeah, difficult it's for tough. other people to see that. Yes. And I feel that when I'm around you, yeah, it's very <laughs> difficult. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry, and I'm sorry, yeah. but you're gonna have to get used to it. Yeah. <laughs> I am, um, yeah, I was, uh, I've been, um, doing some work uh, on what's uh, some of Lacan's work on the four discourses, what's called the four discourses. But one of, one of the things he says is he has one of these, um, one of the discourses called the Asterix Discourse. And the Asterix Discourse is um, a, way of, a, a way of socially interacting in which someone asks questions of what, of what is uh, taken for granted. So the hysterics discourse is the discourse that says, in a, maybe in a, in a relationship, it's why do you love me? What do you want from me? But in society, it's, it's questioning the government or it's questioning just anything in power. And one of the th interesting things is sometimes the person who's questioning is a little bit unhinged. Um, in fact, sometimes to, to question things, you're very unhinged. But there's something really valuable about that. So if someone is questioning you about something you take for granted say i think right someone says to me well people didn't land on the moon and i go well you know they, they did of course we landed on the moon and then they go well, well why do you think that that actually causes me they're questioning me and that causes me to have to think and maybe i go away and read and maybe i start getting more and more into understanding how photography works and a little bit more about how rockets work and so the questioning actually um generates knowledge in me. And I think sometimes it would be good for us to remember that if there's people in society that we feel are asking questions that are pushing against knowledge, even not things that we agree with, that's still good. Yeah, it's great. still great. It's actually, and, and, and sometimes that's why I like conspiracy theorists, because conspiracy theorists, um, one is they can often show real courage, just, you know, um, even if they've got certainty and they're holding on certainty, they've got a certain courage to question things. And hey, when they question me, it forces me to have to think and it forces me to have to reflect more. So I'm just kind of like more and more wanting to say that we kind of need to have space in our society for uh, people who disagree with us. Not, not just morally that that makes us a better person. It's actually, it'll probably be uh, helpful for us, make yeah. us more smarter people. You can just say that you don't believe we landed on the moon. You don't have, yeah. to, you don't have to couch it on all that fancy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it's unnecessary. Uh, do you, you like conspiracy theories? No, I mean, we have to ask since do I like, uh, it's required on this. No, topic. I don't think I do as much because I heard so many as a kid based just around my family. Like people <laughs> would be sense. like, if coming to me like, 
Jerry Falwell usually has people killed. Your dad's lucky. You know, and they would tell us, it's like, these two guys, these two mob guys were heard talking in the airport about killing your father, but instead they decided to set him up. You know, I mean, I would just hear stuff like this constantly because there were people who were so obsessed with my parents. You know what I mean? Like, they could do no wrong. And um, so they had all these, and I was just like, I I don't have time for all this this shit, you know? Um, Yeah, no, I'm not a big conspiracy theory. But, you know, one of the things that I also got from Hegel um, about disagreeing and I really like, and, and this is the part that Pete will miss out because it's about seeing each other's humanity, you know. <laughs> um, but he said, even when we argue and we disagree and we, like, hate each other, there's still, we recognize the other's humanity. Right. And also, that goes straight to what Dr. King, and Dr. King probably actually read some Hegel, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., who I'm talking about, uh, in case people don't know. Um, but Dr. King would say, like, my enemy is not this person my enemy is the misinformation that this person has believed. Yeah. You know? And so their idea of, like, people, those people that that Dr. King was going and sitting down in front of did not recognize his humanity, mm-hmm. did not recognize him as an equal. And I hear people all the same time, like, I can disagree with anybody as long as they recognize my humanity. I'm like, and I have to go, like, well, thank God, like, Gandhi didn't feel that way, or thank God, you know, uh, Dr. King didn't feel that way. You know, we, it's not everybody has to do that, but we do need people who are able to get together, disagree, just recognize, just be forced to recognize that the other is human. And I think that's kind of really a beautiful concept. It's like, so I think we've taken it from like, you know, you can see it here, here, and here of what, what good disagreeing does. We don't just cause us to learn more, but it also causes us to recognize the humanity in others. And to me, that's grace. Yeah, absolutely. And it creates novelty. That's the other thing is when you have uh, arguments and discussion and disagreements, novelty is in new insights arise, new ways of solving things arise. So out of the dialectic of disagreement and back and forth comes new ideas, comes you have to defend, so you have to kind of, you get more knowledge. You could almost call it some sort of a transcendent function. Yeah, oh yeah, there you go. A little, <laughs> you, you need a little bit of Jung in there. Yeah, for you. <laughs> a little pepper for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. How do you guys feel? Good. I like how um, we always went silent. I don't know. You know, Pete's always the big critique. You know. <laughs> yeah, any, any <laughs> thoughts? Uh, my last interview was the really big one that you guys never put up, so. Well, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, Pete lost it. <laughs> That's so right. Pete, well, Pete lost it. My, yeah, he lost it. Oops. Uh, <laughs> more ways than one. We're going to be losing this one, too. <laughs> <laughs> Um, folks, if you haven't seen it, check out uh, The Eyes of Tammy Faye for so. I mean, is that okay to say? Or do yeah, you and I would also say check out the documentary yes. by World of Wonder that was done 20 years earlier Way by more. the same name yep. called The Eyes of Tammy Faye. Such a good documentary. And I think if you watch those two together, you're going to get a much more fuller picture. Yeah, I yeah. absolutely agree. Um, there's That documentary is wonderful. Um, any closing thoughts, Pete? Uh, no, I think that was fascinating. I'm feeling good i i feel like i was like the 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 audience for this one i wasn't thinking i I was just listening to the conversation and then every now and again because you're a very good host you would go you would invite me in and then i felt that i destroyed the flu no no no. it was beautiful you're like a footnote Oh, thank you. you know, you're like a footnote. Yeah, just um, proving everything that we're saying is right in a, in, you know, in a more educated way. Exactly. We appreciate that because you know sometimes we need you smarties to come around and prove us right. Exactly. <laughs> um, any closing? Any thoughts? Anything you want to say, Jay? Any uh, we, we, any it, pieces of advice for folks as they enter into this new year um, of of uncertainty and tumult? I would say one is no matter what you're going through, realize you are accepted, accept yourself as that. I mean, seriously, like there's, there's Paul Tillich talks, there's this amazing talk on accepting that you're accepted. And I think there's so much self doubt right now. And I think that's why we're all angry at other people is because we're, 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 we're putting that on, we're, we're projecting that onto them. And I want to say is like, I think a good place to start is start is with self acceptance and knowing that you're accepted, or if you believe in a bigger other or things like that, realizing that big other has accepted you completely as you are, not as you should be, and none of us are ever where we should be. And by doing that, maybe try to start to allow that with other people, because we realize we're all going through a hell of a time right now. So, you know, there, why, I can't blame somebody when I see them have a meltdown at a grocery store, and ripping their mask off. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. You know, like, I'm, now I'm at the point where I'm like, oh, shit, yeah. I kind of get that. Yeah, now, I'm a little you bit. Know? 
So I, I think if we could just have be a little bit more patient with each other, I think that's a good place to go. There's nothing I hate more than when the last piece of advice applies to me personally in many different ways. So, Jay, thank you very much. It was great seeing you, you. Great having you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.